Hi, this is Joe Martin. I'm pastor at First Baptist Church in Toledo, Washington, and thanks for taking a few minutes to listen to and watch this cabin talk. You know, this is really the second part of this kind of why church revisited. And I want to just take a few moments to on more of a conversational level with you on one-on-one -on -one level. Uh, you can watch these messages in our live stream uh, uh, kind of, you know, library. But I just want to talk about, take a few minutes to revisit these talks because a lot of you have asked me about them. There is a resistance in our culture to commitment. And I remember one time watching a, a, a show and the guy, there was a bunch of people in there that were really having a difficult time in their relationships. And one of the people said, this man who would not make a commitment to this woman he had been dating for years and years, he had a commitment disorder. And I kind of thought it was, you know, a little bit tongue in cheek, but it really wasn't. It was serious. Um, uh, he actually, the man actually said, I have a commitment disorder. Um, and then I thought, well, I wonder if that's a thing. And so I looked it up and it's called uh, gamophobia. And maybe the pronunciation's a little bit off, but uh, this is like people who have been through a hurt or a past breakup or something really, really difficult for them. They just have a difficult time, um, uh, you know, making a full commitment for life to somebody. Now, but there's another thing going on to say, what about people who have never been divorced, um, but they've never really had a terrible breakup or really big trauma, but they just... Um, can't make that. They just are not willing to make that commitment. Um, they wait and they wait and they wait forever. It, as a matter of fact, this is really going on in our society. And this is not like judgment on anybody that's watching this, but marriage is at all time low levels in our society. The marriage rate in the United States today is the lowest it's, it's ever been since the government kept keeping records in 1867. This is really important that, you know, approximately 80% of U.S. households were married 70 years ago. The the number of U.S. households where couples are married, 49%. You know, and the fact of the matter is, is that not just, it, it's, there's some cause for concern because um, maybe part of it is, is that the staying married part is equally difficult. It's about the same people, um, total marriage is about 50-50. Um, if not 51, 49% 40, uh, stay married for a lifetime. And part of this could be a cultural thing where we really like options, not commitments. And this is not, um, though the church is supposed to be a kind of salt and light effect on society, American churches in recent um, decades uh, tend to imitate the culture rather than um, elevate the culture. Uh, the Barna Group says that only 17% of people in the United States say that a person's faith is meant to be developed mainly by involvement in a local church. And even the most devoted church groups, such as evangelicals or born-again Christians, generally dismiss the notion that, uh, d dismiss that notion. As a matter of fact, one-third of all evangelicals one out of every five non-evangelicals, born-again adults, endorse the concept that you really need to grow in a community. That means only one out of every four adults who possesses a biblical worldview, that means 25%, agreed, uh, agreed that the centrality of a local church in a person's spiritual growth. And just as few adults, 18%, firmly embrace the idea that spiritual maturity requires involvement in a community of faith. I mean, it's this idea that in our society that it's that that really I don't really need other people to help me in my spiritual growth. Faith as an individual uh, religious consumer experience is not a community centered experience. That's really what they're saying. It's an individual experience, not us together, but me. And God. And, and in part, that's true that we do have this, first of all, our relationship with Jesus. That's it. But this is to be carried out as disciples, not as a disciple. Many churches teach that church membership is somehow 
not really a spiritual thing, that it's kind of like it's a worldly idea that churches stole from, I don't know, the Lions Club or the Masons or something else, some fraternity. But not, but we do become members of other things. We will become members if it offers us benefits like Amazon Prime or Costco. But membership that comes with committing are expectations. The strange thing that people that are professing Christians seem to think is worldly or kind of a little bit creepy or culty. The fact that the fact is that the word member was a Christian word first that we came up with. Everyone else took it later, watered it down, used it to market or to um, use it for their own benefit. You know, when Paul was writing to a local church that was probably likely smaller than not much bigger than the average church in America, which is around 60 to 65, um, he wrote this 1900 years before Costco, he said this, for even as the body is one and yet it's many, many members and yet all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body. So also is Christ. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks or whether slaves or free. And we we're all made to think of one spirit for the body is not one member, but many. If the foot says, because I am not a hand, I am not a part of the body. It is not for this reason any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, because I am not an eye, I am not a part of, of the body. It is not for this reason any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were a hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed his members, each one of them in the body, just as he desired. If they were all one member, where would the body be? But now... We are many members, but one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, or again, the hand of the, to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, it is much truer that the members of the body, which seem to be weaker, are necessary. And those members of the body, which we deem less honorable, on these we bestow more abundant honor, and our less presentable members become much more presentable. Whereas, our more presentable members have no need of it, but God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to the member which lacked, so that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. And if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. You know, the Bible says that we are to live in this relationship, as Ephesians 5.30 says, because we are members of his body. For, you know, a lot of times this gets balled up in the idea that our idea of the word church is not really the idea of a body of relationships with each other, a way of being in a relationship and living in interdependency with each other and love and support and weeping with those. We, we think of the church as like this institutional thing like this organization instead of an organism. It's really hard to break out of it because we have, you know, since Constantine, uh, we have this very like hierarchical kind of concept about church as this kind of other thing. Like it's not us together. It's this other thing that is kind of over us or around us or imposing its will upon us. So for nearly 2,000 years, followers of Jesus somehow figured out a way, oftentimes in spite of organized religion, to practice body life as members of local churches. As a matter of fact, a lot of you, if you've had this experience, the best experiences you ever had were when you were, um, when you were in a church that had this body life with each other, that they just it worked. Maybe it was your youth group or something, but you had this love for one another and you connected with one another and you supported one another. So the question is, why do you need a local church at all? Now, some of you say the question was why church, but why a local church? Or in the case of some of you that are around within the proximity of where TFBC is, where I'm at, why be a part of that church? Now, first of all, I would say whether it's TFBC or any other church, we need that body life. And by church, I mean ecclesia, 
not a place or just a, not just a, you know, an or some kind of a meeting, but I mean, this relationship, I want to make really clear about that, that we work to be a part of that. And why? Why do you need that? Well, first of all, I would say you need your own committed church family. Uh, I say, why? Why that? Because you need some place where you can have people help you and encourage you. And maybe it's this church or maybe it's another. And you say, well, I'm a member of the invisible church of all Christians, uniting all, all true Christians. Why should I be committed to one? Why can't I just bounce around? Well, you are a member of a human family too, but you still need your own family. You're a part of the human family. It is in your own visible, imperfect family, and we all have them. You learn how to mature and learn how to love and get along with others, or in some cases not. Humans don't mature well when they're feral, just living in the wild. Followers, and you know, we we don't we don't really we don't really mature well, and neither do just Christians that are just freelancing it, or followers of Jesus that really don't have this connection. In your local church family, where you gather weekly, at least, with real people, without problems, that you know and are known to, you learn to love and practice patience, kindness and generosity and faithfulness, to take them to the hospital or maybe fix a dryer or even bring them a dryer. Why do you need to be a member of a church, a local church that is your own place, your own body or our um, way of being group of people, whether it's CFBC or somewhere else, well, we have an embodied faith. We are not just, we have an embodied faith, just like God became flesh in Jesus. God manifests himself in our lives through these physical bodies. And we live, um, we don't live uh, just kind of virtually. We have an embodied faith and our faith can't be fully lived by letters alone. Even Paul recognized that we needed each other, the physical presence. He wrote Romans, um, wrote the book of Romans, but he knew that they needed more than a letter. He said in Romans 10, 10, 1, 10, he says, always in my prayers, making requests, if perhaps now at least by the will of God, I may succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you, listen, so that I may impart some spiritual gift to you that you may be established. That is, that you may be encouraged together with, that I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us by one another's faith and yours by mine. You know, letters are good. And even a video message like this is good, but you can shut me off. You can, it can be ignored or misunderstood. Um, but being present is um, really essential for to be fully discipled. You can shut off the video. You can turn off the podcast. You can jump ahead when it gets a little bit difficult. But Paul wrote during a time when de-churching, people quitting, giving up was super common. And so I want to tell you, he recognized the need for us to have a personal contact with each other. You know, uh, Hebrews 10 says, as I've repeated before, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as a habit of some, but encourage one another all the more as we see the day drawing near. So I want to stop right there to say, we need this for each other. I want you to kind of try and break out of the idea of church as just this kind of place you go. Uh, the word church, the English word comes from a uh, Germanic idea of Kirk, which is was like a place. But the original word, ecclesia, means we're called out to live our lives together. We're called out together, a fellowship of life. So I want you to begin to think of it that way. And then as you, wherever you are, make this, this coming Lord's Day, um, gather with other believers um, it's okay to go to a place of gathering or a building if you're blessed enough to have that. Get together, sit around like what we do it every Sunday morning. We have a service where we worship 
And then you have a meal together at 930. You can go to a class or you can just sit around a table and visit. And uh, we take some time to share God's truth and learn how to live out our discipleship together. So make that a priority this week. I want to thank you for watching this. I also want to thank you for giving. Some of you have been so good and so supportive. And um, you can give online. Go to um, TFBC, um, ToledoForcebaptist.com and forward slash give, and it will explain the whole thing to you. Please do that because there's so many needs out there as we seek to do the right thing. And But most of all, what we'd really like to do is just to, if it's possible for you to physically be present, be there so we can gather together and we can encourage each other. Thank you so much for watching this and share it with somebody if it helps.